know, have a good conversation with Dr. Kavita Bapat. So, Kavita, Thank over you. to you. Thank you so much. One, all one more thing I would like to say for Kavita is that she speaks for the cause. She's not uh, scared of anybody and not hesitant. And whenever there is a problem, she's ready to speak out. So that is love a very you. good quality, love quality of leadership. Love you, love you. So, yes. And she helps everyone out, helps everyone out. Maybe it's the local or it's national. She's always there. And Bapit, ma'am, I really love, love you. The last part, the every dog lover, the passionate for sari, the coolest grandmother, and the person with faith. That's, that's you, amazing. Thank you so much. I'm so blessed to, to have my Indoris are standing with me. So, Suchitra Mandit, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm really blessed to do this program. Really, really happy. First of all, I'd like to tell that Suchitra Pandit is a person with a par excellence. As Dr. Asha Bakshi has said, she has a remarkable contribution as a leader, as a mentor, as a president of various things. But now she is now at present as a president of Justosis or the world. Uh, this is a this is a world body, and she's president of the Justosis. Exceptional singer, as everybody talked about, and exemplary and a dedication in her world. What the way that she works. Overall, an outstanding individual, talented, expertise, leadership, my mentor. I always say she is the person who took me from Indore to take on the stage. Love you for this. We have traveled together, me, Dr. Bakshi and Dr. Sujitra Pandit together, and we had a real fun all the time. And the best part, her dedication and commitment is really commendable. And she serves as a shining example to others to follow. So, Sujita, Madam, Madam, welcome to this stage. We'll have just a few questions and the, this will be a take-home message for many. And we are going to talk, as being you are a Justosis president, so we'll love to talk about something which is hypertensive, though the subject today is not of the hypertension, it's endometriosis, but still we'll love to talk about the few questions about the hypertension. It's a very, very important topic. So, the, the first question to you is that what are the hypertensive diseases or we are talking about? And what are the changes of definition which we are seeing nowadays? See, hypertension is and in a pregnancy is a big topic, very threatenful. It is one of the reasons for the maternal mortality. So over to you. And um, the, the question is, I think I, I'm not repeating it. The question is the definition and what are the diseases which we have. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, Kavita, for inviting me for this particular session. And I'm glad that, you know, this is a topic which we are discussing. I know uh, endometriosis is also important, but this is something when we're talking of maternal mortality, hypertensive disorders in pregnancy are the contributor to a very high percentage of maternal as well as perinatal morbidity and mortality. In fact, it's second to PPH. So when you're talking about what it comprises, obviously, whenever there is a rise of blood pressure, systolic to 140 and diastolic to 90, that is taken as blood pressure in pregnancy. And what does it comprise of? Obviously, preeclampsia, eclampsia, gestational hypertension, and we are talking of the chronic hypertension. And if you're looking at the percentage, almost 8 to 10% of our OPD patients have hypertension in pregnancy. And out of this, around 1.5 to 2% still go in for eclampsia. And this is the national, as per the National Eclampsia Registry. Now, when we're talking of definitions, I'd like to bring out two important things in this. One is that the time when we start treating is 140, 90. Earlier times, people used to take 150, 100. But now the ISSHP and the World Organization Gestosis have agreed that the BP that would be important is 140, 90. Of course, you take it on two occasions. Sometimes the patient is very tensed up or she's climbed upstairs or she's chewed tobacco. So you may get a wrong reading. So please repeat that blood pressure after 20 to 25 minutes. And if you still find that the BP is coming 140, 90, that is the time to start treating. The second most important thing is we used to talk of mild, moderate, severe. Now it is severe. So non-severe includes mild to moderate. And severe is when the BP is 160, 100 and and above and all the severe that are accompanied with it is there. And non-severe is anything 140, 90 to 149, 109. That would be taken as the uh, Now protein urea is no longer taken as a must for defining preeclampsia because when you're talking of preeclampsia, it's the onset of hypertension after 20 weeks. We used to always say protein urea. But now proteinuria is not necessary because the multi-organ problems are seen even before the proteinuria has started. 
So that is another change which is coming. And the most important thing is today when we're talking of how has that changed, the management therefore changes de depending on what category the patient belongs to. And we have this new entity of atypical preeclampsia, which defines none of the definitions, meaning it just comes on as a surprise. So we are learning more and more of this particular entity, Kavita. Correct. Amazing. So you mean that we are, we are worried at the 140-90, we are worried not to worried about the worried or we not to worried about the proteinuria and yes. atypical preeclampsia is another big thing. It's a really good thing. So yes. are the screening modalities are adequate for the new tests? Are there uh, anything in the country which we talk about, anything we have to do to for the sonography as we are already having? Dr. Kuldeep Singh is also with us, but uh, the dialogue is between you and me. If we'll need, we'll take him in. But what I think the any modalities, screening modalities are there in our country for this, how to access the sonographic everything. Now, yeah. now, now, basically, HDP, we call it hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, is such an enigmatic condition and it has got such varied clinical presentations and so many phenotypes that there is no single test which fits the bill, you know, WHO's uh, test always, uh, screen test always says, it should be simple, easy, inexpensive, reliable, and replicable. Now, oh. the tests which were there earlier, you know, simple OPD tests are taking the weight, taking the BP of the patient, taking the history of the patient, previous history of preeclampsia, we used to put in a tick mark. But what oh. we find today, you know, there are fancy tests, of course, ultrasound is there, wherever access is there, you have this wonderful aspirate trial, which has shown us that you can do all, you know, the basic uh, uh, maternal markers, including mean arterial pressure. And along with that, you do the nuchal scan and you do the dual marker. But along with the dual marker, you're also not just doing PAPE, but you're also doing the PLGF so that the moms of these can be calculated. And they have found that wherever there is a positive test, the patient who is having this test should be given 150 milligrams of aspirin, low-dose aspirin is called, and then it reduces the incidence of preterm preeclampsia by nearly 60%. There is a false positive rate of 5, uh, 10% of year. But remember, the aspirate trial is a HIFI screening test. I say HIFI because it's available to the metropolitan cities and not in every medical college. Again, when you've got the combination of biophysical and biochemical markers, they are wonderful. There is so much of work going on in that. But currently, we are not, you know, we can't reproduce them everywhere. So what fits the bill is what we have devised through the Gestosis India Association, the Gestosis score. Gestosis score has got 27 maternal characteristics. We label it as mild, moderate, and severe. Mild is easy to remember. It gets a score of one. Where mild, you're talking about the age of the patient, the weight of the patient, the BM, history of PCOS. Yeah. And today, history of ART with ICSI is given as a grade one. Right. And along with that, if this family history of dyslipidemia, but the moment the patient has a history of familial history of preeclampsia, the mother has had it, sister has it, that goes to grade two. Pre gestational diabetes goes to grade two, or a history of chronic hypertension goes to grade two. And in the severe, you have got anyone who's got inherited or acquired thrombophilia or pre-existing diabetes mellitus or a chronic kidney disease. And very important, Kavita, today, ART, when you're talking of egg donors yeah. and your you know, sperm donors, again, that particular group, embryo donation, all these go into three. So whenever a patient comes in, if you have a quick tick mark, we have an Android, you know, Android phone, those who have it, this can be and, and, and actually that down. score is available. And you can calculate the score. And if the score is three and above, just close your eyes and start 75 milligrams of low dose aspirin. Now, 70 is a you know constant controversy, but currently, even the aspirin people have said they don't have a trial to see whether 75 is better or 150 is better. Yeah, recommending 150. We are still saying so 75 milligrams plus 1.5 grams of calcium, and this definitely now this has been validated. Dr. Meeta from Jammu has done that beautiful study. She's validated the specificity, sensitivity, and it's already in the Jogi Journal, May 19, I mean, 2022. Amazing. So all medical colleges are doing the thesis. So we would say gestosis score is a simple, easy, reliable test available everywhere. And anybody, even the simple interns and nurses can also do it. 
And now the test, one more test I'd like to tell you about is the Congo red test, where suggested that women who are having preeclampsia, that urine contains misfolded proteins. So if a Congo red dye is added to that, this Congo red dye is an azo dye, it joins up to the amyloid fibrils and gives a positive red test. So if this test is positive, this patient will develop preeclampsia. So WHO has currently done this study in Bangladesh and Mexico. It's yet to come out into the our part of the world. So that still is there. And there are many research tests which are going on. But today, what we see as a most promising test is the gistosis score. Amazing, amazing. Means instead of going into the, all the papes, the nuchal scan, the uh, color Doppler at certain place and the, def, uh, the all the high definition test over there. It's a very good that each and every can, one can do the gistosis score and to find it out. And if the score is three plus, then it's very, and the score is very simple. That's a mild, moderate and severe with several factors. Just take it out and find out. That's, that's amazing. And the Congo red, which you are talking about, it's another future of the thing. Amazing, amazing. So uh, once we diagnose it in the right time and the right thing, it's very important. Now, can you put some tips or really like to talk about the usage of Maxil and the role of Maxil in a neuroprotection, which we all talk about. So I think that will be, you know, yeah. the crisp way we can give some take work message to all the listeners. See, magnesium sulfate is a wonder drug of this century. It has been used since 1980s in India, but it was only after collaborative eclampsia trial that everybody accepted because it was a huge RCG done. Today, we say Mexel is the gold standard for prevention and treatment of recurrent conversions. So whether you give it by the Pritchard's regime, whether you give it by the Suspans regime, it doesn't matter. In uh, corporate hospitals where it is possible to have infusion pumps, this is much more kinder to the patient because it doesn't give those luteal abscesses and it's not painful. But in the medical colleges where infusion pumps are not always available, you can follow the standard Pritchard's regime. But remember the loading dose is the same, four grams. I will be looking at the clock, 15 minutes, and then five grams every four hourly, which you are going to be doing if you're doing the Pritchard's regime, of course. In the Pritchard's regime, the total loading dose would be 4 plus 10, that is 14. And in the Zeuspan's regime, it is 4 plus 1 gram per hour. But remember, it has to be given for 24 hours. One important tip which I would like to say, Maxil definitely gives a neuroprotection in the gestational age of 28 to 32. Yeah. And after the delivery is imminent within 24 hours. But if you give it later on, we still don't know whether it really has a beneficial effect. But what has been seen in Surya, we have a big NISU. It has been seen that the neural outcomes, neuroprotection is definitely there in these smaller babies. And yes. whether you are using it for preeclampsia uh, eclampsia prevention or whether you're using for neuroprotection, you have to monitor it. So the re respiratory rate, the patellar reflexes, and the urine output are very, very important. If you monitor these clinically, this has been shown to be superior to your biochemical monitoring. So keep Maxel. It is easy, cheap, store your maternity units, do the eclampsia drills. And Kavita, we've been doing it for so many workshops and you know so many places that eclampsia drill should come just like that. And one yeah. more important thing is today we have a ready-made IV Maxel, which yeah, is coming. Yeah. That is easy. It doesn't you know, cost too much of a uh, uh, memory. Yeah. And quickly, you can give it. And it can be given easily over. Continue there. for 24 hours. But once you know it's a severe preeclampsia and there is an imminent eclampsia, the axle prevents the patient from getting convulsions, keeps her in a conscious state, relaxes her, is a cerebral vasodilator, peripheral vasodilator, but you still need antihypertensives for prevention of the stroke. So those are important take home messages. Amazing, amazing. And, so the, so the and, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Continue, no. sorry, and sorry. and and Maxel in the good old days, patient used to be unconscious, but today patients are conscious. Yeah. Babies have got much better outcomes. Yeah, amazing, amazing. So last, in last, you can say in last uh, ten years, the use of Maxel has been widespreadly being used by all, and uh, availability is also there. And intravenous has ch will change the trend of this thing. Any, any, you will really like to talk something about the current antihypertensives. Right. So, so current, the, we, when we were students, the uh, antihypertensives were the different one. But what okay. are the new one, which which uh, what should be the take work message for all? Right. Yeah. See, for the non severe, we are still saying levitalol and nifedipine both can be used. Yeah. Uh, 
used to like methyl dopa for this particular non-severe variety, but it's no longer available. And of course, the new drug which has entered the armamentarium is nicardipin. So this is the same family as nifedipin. So this is for the non-severe. But for the severe, you have the IV labetalol. You can use anything, the Parkland regime, or you can use the Sibai regime, whichever way it gives good results. But remember, the pulse rate has to be more than 100. If there is a bradycardia or if there is CCF or diabetes, then it's better to use nifedipine. But one important message I would like to give, whichever antihypertensive you are giving, give it with the understanding that there is going to be time for the effect. We want to lower the BP promptly, but not rapidly because the precipitous fall is dangerous and never give nifedipine sublingually. So whatever you're using today, labetalol is available as 100 BD, as 200 BD, as 200 TDs. You can go right up to 200 four times a day. But to step in and add nifedipine. And right. when you're telling me patients that use these drugs, time, label kardo time ka. 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, give them the timing because then they will take it correctly. So if you're using one drug, then it is easy to label the time. If you're using two drugs, again, put the timings and tell the patient when she should take her BP. So if she's coming to the daycare center, the BP can be taken there. If she's got a BP machine at home, she can monitor and she can send all this by WhatsApp to you. But that monitoring is very important. And all these drugs have got side effects, but finally... We have to see if the patient is benefiting. How is she benefiting? And then you have to decide, do you want to really deliver her? If she's not responding, if her uh, period of gestation is adequate, you've given the steroids to her for lung maturity, then you consider delivery. Correct. Amazing. So, lebetulol, nicardine, or nifedipine is a, in, the, in the queue, you can say. And the timing is very, very important. The one drug or the true drug, the timing. So when should you actually deliver the patient of severe preeclampsia? When you want to deliver? I think few more questions. I'd suggest yes. a yes. in the In the non-severe where the BP is well controlled, even if the patient is on antihypertensive, you've done your monitoring and the fetus is growing well, the biophysical profiles are good, you can safely go up to term, you can... 38, 39 weeks, you can allow them to go into spontaneous labor. But at any time you feel that the BP is rising or the baby problems are there, Dopplers are there, consider delivery and deliver them. But in emergency situations where the BP is really very high, you know, what we call a severe preeclampsia, in that you give your Maxil, give your antihypertensives, stabilize the patient, give her the steroids and consider delivery. In the preterm preeclampsia, that's a problem where, you know, you even life is at stake. You want to save the mother, you also want to save the baby. In those situations, you must consider delivery imminent, but stabilize the patient. If she is not in a tertiary care center, consider moving there. But before she ships there, put in an IV line, give her the injectable Maxil, give her the Labetalol, and then only shift her. But in those cases, you have to deliver much more. Yeah? And there, if you have to do a section, remember the uterine segment is not well formed. So the thick segment, say you have to take out that preterm baby. So make sure you have a good clinic experience assistant with you. You have availability of blood. Labs are there to support you and a good NICU to take care of the baby. Amazing. Yes, you are absolutely right. This depends upon the hemodynamically stable patient or unstable patient. If it's a stable patient, we can deliver it with the planning. And if she is not stable, then we have to make her stable and deliver it as early as possible with a, such a center, which is having all the facilities available about the blood products, the NICUs and everything. Amazing. So the if, uh, what is the best in anesthesia, which you suggest? Because this is another question from uh, uh, years together, we are talking about ki GA day, ki spinal day or whatever. So what best in anesthesia you suggest about? And followed by, we will conclude it with any postpartum management, which we will like to do. Yeah. So in HDP, the best anal anesthesia is regional, either spinal or epidural. The only time you give a GA is when there is status. There's this eclampsia. The, when uh, the patient's BP is very high and she's just fitting, you've given the Maxil. Those are the times. And if the spinal fails. But remember, for the spinal failure also, there is a drill. Even the GAs are difficult. So an experienced team is very necessary because these women have got short necks and they've got hypertension, vocal cords are really matters. So they can be very difficult. So that's why regional is always preferred. And one thing I'd like to say that post-delivery monitoring of patient is very essential. 
just because you've delivered the baby doesn't mean the patient will th or not throw up it. So continue Maxil for 24 hours, continue your BP monitoring. And we have also suggested that they should get Floatrons and low molecular weight heparin six hours if you've given regional six hours, six to eight hours after that, because these patients are quite edematous, obese, and they can have diabetes also. And then once they've stabilized, mobilize the patient as soon as possible, monitor the BP. When you're discharging them, make sure you've explained them how to take the BP measurements and call them back every third day or let them measure the BP at home and let you know. And sooner or later, shift her from that big labetrol dose to the smaller doses. Maybe an amlodipine can be a good option. But if you find after two weeks, her BP is still persistently high, refer her to a physician, a cardiologist, check the renal plus renal dopplers after six weeks. And if she's obese, lifestyle changes. And Kavita, one last message which I'd like to say is, these patients of preeclampsia can conceive at a drop of a hat. So contraception bohot zaruri hai. And if they want to conceive again, they must consult their physician or the gynecologist for a preconception counseling. So we can take it from there. So bilkul bulega nahi. Amazing, amazing, amazing. The way you put the anesthesia is the way it should be. And the same with the postpartum management. We have, if we have seen in the last few years that there is a decrease over the years of the eclampsia and, and probably the hard work of VOBGYN and especially you people who are working very hard into the field of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Probably this is the one of the reason and the maternal mortality because of the Eclampsia probably has gone down. Otherwise, also the maternal mortality has gone down of this country. So we're really proud of all of us to work hard for the subject of hyper. And you people are doing amazing work into the hyper. So congratulations and thank you so much for being with us. And this is just one line. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in atypical preeclampsias or if you is out of turn and has convulsed, we mustn't forget the autoimmune problems. So investigate them because those are the ones which can lead to preterm, you know, convulsions and preterm abruptions. So we have to investigate for the autoimmune bit in those particular cases too. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. I think everyone so over much. there will be will enjoy the conversation and thank you so much uh, for being with us. Thank you. And so all much. the best to you for your presidential. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.